Let me try this again. Steve Dangle here with the annual Leafs Prospect Pyramid, where we look at the best prospects in the Toronto Maple Leaf system. You may recall last year when I called Nick Robertson a defenseman, which he's very not. And this year, I want a shot at redemption. And I've learned that part of success you gotta surround yourself with smart people. So I'm gonna tell you everything I know about the Leafs prospects, but I've also recruited three experts to help me with this year's prospect pyramid. And those three experts offering their perspectives throughout this video are Rachel Dory, former hockey ops for the New Jersey Devils and one half of the Staff and Graph podcast. Scott Wheeler, a reporter for The Athletic who's writing a book on the Leafs and the NHL draft. And Lauren Kelly, an OHL scout for EliteProspects.com who I happen to work with at Sportsnet. Now. Let's get started with this year's Leafs Prospect Pyramid and a little bit of history about it. If you've never heard of it before or you don't remember, the Prospect Pyramid is just a new way of organizing your favorite team's prospects that I came up with a few years ago. Instead of doing like a top 20, for example, and ranking every prospect, this guy's 20th, 19th, 18th, why are we arguing over the difference between the 20th and 18th ranked guy? So, my Prospect Pyramid has six tiers. Tier six, we don't even name the prospects. It's just everybody else. If they make it, great, and I'll look dumb down the line, but for now, they are the longest of long shots. Tier five, they're also long shots, but they have a chance of at least having a cup of coffee in the NHL. Tier four is a bit of a weird one. They're not guaranteed to make the NHL, but I wouldn't necessarily call them long shots either. A lot of guys in this tier might end up playing at least a little bit, but they don't project to have the highest of ceilings. Tier 3, now we're cooking. We're talking about guys who are probably more than 50% likelihood to make the NHL and play at least 150-200 games. Look at it, some of the names I'm about to tell you, you would hope more than that. Some of them are guys with modest ceilings, but they're likely to make it, or high ceilings, but it's unsure if they'll actually reach it. Tier 2, these are your gimmies. They're guys with high ceilings who have to make the NHL, otherwise they're a bust. But they're not gonna miss because it's tier two, they're gonna play, and they're gonna be good. And tier one, the elite of the elite, we're talking the crown jewel of your prospect pool, a guy who is going to completely change the course of your franchise. And we'll start there because this is my fifth year doing the prospect pyramid. The first year was 2016, and so far only one player has ever been in tier one for the Toronto Maple Leafs, and that's Austin Matthews. That's an easy pick. He's the first overall pick. He's got an elite ceiling. He's not just gonna make it, he's gonna make it and be a star, guaranteed. The problem was 2016, the Leafs prospect pool was absolutely stacked, and I think it set kind of an unrealistic standard for years going forward. If I could do it over again, I would have put Mitch Marner in tier one. He had 126 points in 63 games in his draft year and he was picked fourth overall and won basically every award you could. What else do you want him to do? He ended up making the NHL as a teenager. 61 points is the lowest he's ever gotten. Past two seasons he's been well, well, well above a point a game. That's an elite prospect. So now that we know that, now that we've made the tier one standard a little bit more realistic, should we put any Leaf prospects in tier one this year? Because, say it with me, who's the Leafs' best prospect right now? Three, two, one. Of course it's Nick Robertson, of course. But we're talking a second round pick, a good second round pick against a fourth overall pick. It shouldn't matter where they were picked, but it matters a little. Mitch Marner was a monster in the OHL for a long time. Nick Robertson, very good in the OHL until last year when he was elite. So for that reason, I'm still gonna be stingy with tier one, Nobody is in there in 2020. So we move on to tier two. In tier two, I see a clear cut. There's three players in here. I'm not ranking them one through three, but in no particular order. Let's start with Nick Robertson. Allow me to give you some details. I should probably start with what position he plays. Nick Robertson is a, is a, uh, um, he's a, uh, oh my God, you got me the he's a, uh, forward. He's <laughs> forward. Nick Robertson is a forward. Yeah, that wasn't so hard. So this is what I was saying about Nick Robertson. In 2019, second round pick, 53rd overall. And that's because he had a good draft year. He had a very good draft year. In 54 games, he put up 55 points, 27 of them 
goals. But part of the reason draft heads were so high on this guy, projecting him to be potentially a first rounder in 2019, is because with a September 11th birthday, he barely made the cutoff for the 2019 draft. Meaning he was almost a full year younger than some of the other players that were eligible in the exact same draft. Shouldn't that mean you grade him on a curve a little bit? Let's say you want to be super hardcore about it. No, it's the NHL. It should be hard to make. There is no grading curve. In his draft plus one year, that's last season, in 46 games in the OHL with the Peterborough Peets, he put up 86 points, 55 of which were goals. Nick Robertson had 27 goals the year before, which is a good goal total, but in fewer games, he more than doubled it. Nick Robertson was a monster in the OHL last year. And we got a bit of a unique look at him at the NHL level during the playoffs in the bubble. Now how do you expect a player to look after not playing for months and months and months and also when they did play it was in the OHL against junior players and now they're playing at the NHL against men at the highest level because it's a playoffs. There were times where I thought he looked a bit out of sorts and he made a couple weird decisions but he just kept shooting the puck over and over and over again and it eventually went in. He did score in game three, giving the Leafs a 3-0 lead that they promptly wasted, but that wasn't his fault! He had two goals, three assists in five games at the 2020 World Juniors. This year, he will not be playing for Team USA because he's trying to make the Leafs out of camp. Well, wouldn't he be better off playing with Team USA at the World Juniors? He might miss the start of camp. It might hurt his chance of making the Leafs. This guy's serious, by the way. Nick Robertson has been training in Canada since the late spring. He is in this to win this, and he is shooting his shot with a bazooka. Forget the goal totals. You saw the effort level during some Leaf games last year. Everyone should be salivating over a kid who wants to be a Leaf this badly. It's awesome. It's interesting that they've decided that he's not going to the World Juniors. That really reinforces the fact that he wants to make the Leafs. It also reinforces the fact that the team believes he can make the team. You know, everybody's starting on a clean slate with uh, the season having been delayed. And I think that gives Robertson his best opportunity if he's going to attend a full training camp. Maybe it would have been a good idea for him to be playing more meaningful games at the World Juniors, but I understand with, you know, quarantining, come on the way back for seven days and maybe missing a couple of regular season games to start the season is an ideal for him or the Leafs. We saw him take significant steps in his defensive game. He was a lot more, you know, involved in play in his own end. Seeing him play both special teams was very important. I don't necessarily think we'll see him play penalty kill in the NHL to start. I think they may see, try him on the power play just to see where his comfort level is and how he adjusts to that. Maybe that's something we can see him do maybe a couple seasons down the line if he can make the team out of training camp this year. Like I said, I don't like ranking players for the prospect pyramid, but Nick Robertson is the best the Leafs have. Next in tier two, if Nick Robertson is the best forward the Leafs have, Rasmus Sandin is the best defensive prospect the Leafs have. If Nick Robertson is definitely the Leafs best forward prospect, Rasmus Sandin, also in tier two, is their best defensive prospect. The first rounder, 29th overall from 2018, is 20 and he's going to turn 21 in March. He's a little easier to explain because out of all the guys I'm about to talk about in this process, prospect pyramid, I think he's the guy we've seen the most. It was over a year ago now, but last preseason, early in the last AHL season, the Leafs organization, led by Sheldon Keefe because he was the Marlies coach still at the time, they were pushing Rasmus Sandin as hard as they could. He was playing 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, half an hour a game. Makes the Leafs to begin the season, and it was so-so. He had a few defensive warts, he got rocked a couple times, but he didn't look totally Totally out of place. It was just a situation where they didn't need to rush him. He goes to the AHL and he produced wonderfully. Two goals, 13 assists for 15 points in just 21 games in the minors. And of course later in the season injuries start to mount so the Leafs decide to call him up and burn the first year of his ELC. Scores a goal and seven assists for eight points in 28 NHL games which is a 23 point pace. Now he wasn't doing 25-30 minutes. He only averaged 14 minutes and 19 seconds 
seconds a game in the NHL, but for a rookie defenseman and one as young as he was, that's still not bad at all. Now, he didn't play in the bubble, and with the Leafs addition on the back end and Travis Dermott getting re-signed, it's unclear exactly where he fits with the Leafs this season, but he's obviously going to be a good player. His next contract could be a tough conversation for him. First year of his ELC, he only played in 28 games. This season's going to be shortened, and it's definitely looking like he won't get into every single game. Just something to keep an eye on, but that's like a year and a half from now. Good player, big minute potential. The last player I have in Tier 2 for the Leafs is someone who was just selected by them in the 2020 draft. 15th overall, Rodion Amarov. He's been playing this season with Salavat Yulaev of the KHL, but when he was picked, some people were upset. It wasn't the usual, oh, the Leafs pick another smallish forward, although there was an aspect of that. It was that you go to his Hockey DB page, and in 21 games last season, he had zero goals and two assists, and the Leafs just picked that guy 15th overall? Well, you'd already know about this if you saw my video that I made on Amarov when the Leafs drafted him. That doesn't tell the story at all. Teenagers rarely play in the KHL, and when they do, they rarely play a lot. That might explain why he only got into 21 games and why he only had two points. In the MHL, which is the KHL's junior equivalent, he had 10 goals and 22 points in 17 games. That's how he performed against his peers. This year in the KHL, he's already quadrupled his point total. He's got five goals and three assists for eight points in 23 games so far. His ice time's been pretty limited because, again, it's not Salavat Yulaev's job to uh, develop Leaf prospects. It's just not. They're trying to win games. But if you've been seeing his highlights, he's got a wicked laser of a shot, and he's going to be at the World Juniors for Russia this year, so he'll definitely be a guy to watch. Really, the big thing is that he just needs to get stronger. Uh, he's only 168 pounds right now. That's going to help as he puts on more muscle. He's going to become more of an effective player in the KHL and the, both the NHL. His ability to like anticipate plays before they happen is just at an extremely high level. That will serve him well uh, when he, as he adjusts to playing in the pro leagues. He's very involved at both ends of the ice, and I think that's something that's really encouraging when you kind of look at, you know, the more recent prospects that have made the Leafs in the past. You know, sometimes their defensive awareness or their play in their own end is kind of a weaker point, and I think with Amarov, the Leafs shouldn't have that problem. Moving on to tier three. We start with a guy that at one point I had in the second tier and I think everything went off the rails. Sorry, everything went off the rails for us, not for him. At one point, the hype for Timothy Liljegren heading into the 2017 draft was huge. Top five pick potential. But then Mono sort of derailed the season. He slides to 17, the Leafs pick him, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, they got the steal of the draft. He's going to be the next Eric Carlson. Well, now he's 21. He's going to be 22 in April. He's only played in 11 NHL games, and he has one assist to show for it. I don't know if that's exactly a fair assessment, though, because it was 11 games, but it was at an awful part of the season, if you remember. The Leafs were playing terribly, and there were a few nights where he was the seventh defenseman, barely getting in. There's an argument to be made that you need depth, and if he was so great, he would have found a way, but the Leafs were not good. But how about this? The Marlies last season struggled mightily, especially after Sheldon Keefe left the team uh, for the head coach job with the Leafs. Timothy Lilligren was still pretty good. In 40 games, he had 5 goals, 25 assists for 30 points. That's a 0.75 points per game pace in the minors. That's pretty good for a right-handed defenseman, something the Leafs desperately need. You don't have to end up as good as Eric Carlson to be a quality NHL player. And Timothy Lilligren looks like he still really has that potential. Up next, we have a player that's so key to the Leafs' future, and he was a guy that I almost forgot about. But at least I got his position right. He's a center. Philip Hollander, and if you're wondering when did the Leafs draft Philip Hollander, they didn't. Hollander was picked in the second round, 58th overall in 2018 by the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the Leafs got him along with the 15th overall pick they used on Rodion Amarov from the Penguins for Kasperi Kapanen. He's six foot tall, 190 pounds, not mind blowing in either direction, and he's playing in the SHL with Lulia. He's got two goals, seven assists, nine points in 20 games this season, which is fine. I didn't understand why some guys were so high on this player. Philip Hollander is a big reason why I reached out to Scott, because I know he loves him and 
Lauren and Rachel. The numbers don't seem to tell the entire story with this guy. He's a compelling prospect. He's only 20 years old, despite the fact that he feels like he's been a prospect forever. He was a late birthday in his draft year. Despite the fact that he's 20, he also has four full pro seasons under his belt already. As I say this, he's got 52 points in 98 career SHL games as a 20-year-old. He's just an impressive kid. He's been around for a while, and it feels like he's been on the scene for a while, but he does a lot of things really well. He broke his leg last season, and it derailed him a little bit, but can do a little bit of everything, can play the wing, can certainly play center, plays with a ton of pace to his game. And there's some sneaky skill there. I, I think he's the kind of kid who projects more as a, a sort of third line type, but I think he's certainly capable of getting there and can't wait to see what he looks like when he eventually comes over and sort of tries it with the Marlies and potentially tries it with the Leafs. So he's a kid I would, I would definitely keep an eye on, if you will. Flies a little bit under the radar. Staying in Tier 3, another forward, this time a right winger. Another guy you might have forgotten was in the Leafs system, Joey Anderson. When did the Leafs draft? They didn't. He was drafted in the third round, 73rd over in 2016 by the New Jersey Devils. And he was traded straight up for Andreas Janssen and then the Leafs locked him up to a three-year deal, $750,000 against the cap. That is a deal that's gonna make it way easier for him to be in the Leafs lineup because they're gonna need cheap guys. He's 5'11", 190, so again, pretty average, but they're already throwing the Zach Hyman label on this guy because of how tenacious he is. It's a pretty tough bar to meet, but if he can get even 75% of the way there, he'll be a valuable addition. He had 34 points in 44 AHL games last season and six points in 18 games last season with the Devils. He's actually played in 52 NHL games over the past two seasons already, which is why Rachel Dory isn't sure he should even be on this pyramid. She thinks he's a graduate. He's an NHL player. I think Lilia Grin is a top six defenseman. This will be his third year uh, in the AHL. He kind of got yo-yoed in New Jersey. So I don't necessarily know if he counts as a prospect, but if he does for the sake of the pyramid, he's definitely in this tier because he's a player that probably ends up as a middle six player. And, and that is just below kind of the threshold of Robertson, Amarov, and Sandine, who project to be top six forwards and top four defensemen. One last neat thing with Joey Anderson, between the minors and the NHL last season, he played in 62 professional hockey games, just four penalty minutes. That's two minor penalties in 62 games. Up next, a name that has jumped up the prospect pyramid. I didn't have him this high last year, Nick Abruzzese. He was a fourth round pick, 124th overall in 2019, but He's already 21 years old. He'll be 22 in June. The Leafs picked him when he was a little older. And if you look at the numbers, you can see why the Leafs wanted to draft this guy even though he was a little older. In Abruzzese's season that came before the 2018 draft, he had 36 points in 56 games in the USHL with the Chicago Steel. That's fine. The next season, in 82 games, no, the next season, in 62 games, he had 80 points, 29 of them goals. That's an attention grabber. This past season, he played at Harvard, and with 44 points in 31 games, he was Harvard's leading scorer. And just like we said with Joey Anderson, there's another guy in 31 games played, just four penalty minutes, two minors. Next, we have a guy I'm not sure you're gonna agree with, but I think he's done extremely well. SDA, Simeon Dur Argachintsev. He was a third round pick, 76 overall in 2018, and he was the youngest player in the draft. The Leafs love targeting these guys. He's listed as 5'11", 170, which isn't that big, and he's got the baby face, but he's got room to grow. Last year, he was one of the only players I demoted in the prospect pyramid because he got drafted, there was all this hype, he had a really good preseason game, he wowed us with a big windmill deke, and he just didn't take a step. So I issued the challenge. SDA, if you want to get back into tier three, you got to step it up. And he did. In 55 games with the Peterborough Peets, only 12 goals, but 63 assists and 75 points. That is a good year. The knock on him as well, he only put up 75 points because of the 63 assists. And the only reason he had 63 assists is because he was on the same line as Nick Robertson another Leafs prospect. Robertson had 55 goals, SDA had 63 assists. I wonder how many of those assists were Robertson goals. But you know what the best playmakers do? 
Pass to guys who know how to score. This season, he's graduated from junior, and now he's playing in the KHL. He's already put up five points in ten games. And again, a playmaker. One goal, four assists. If you ever want to look up highlights or watch any of his games, he plays for a team called Torpeda Nezhdenovgorod. Or you could just say Torpedo, which is really cool and a great team name. In fact, in a game recently, he was playing against a guy he idolized growing up. Pavel Datsuk, and Datsuk stripped him of the puck and made him look awful. In an interview with reporter Jillian Kemmerer, SDA revealed that after the game, he told Datsuk, it was an honor to get killed by you. I like this kid. <laughs> the last player in Tier 3 is a guy who I originally had in Tier 4, but after hearing the glowing reviews from our experts, I just started to feel stupid. So, Roni Hirvonen is in Tier 3. He was a late second rounder, 59th overall in this past draft here in 2020. Now, he's a little guy, 5'9", 164 pounds, but he's playing for Asat in the Finnish Men's League, and he's going to be at the World Juniors coming up, so you get to watch him there. One of three Leaf prospects who will be on Team Finland. Last season, Roni Hirvin, not a huge scorer in a league with not a lot of scoring. 16 points in 52 games in the SM Liga with Asat. So far this season, he's got 9 points in 21 games, which is a better pace, and he already has 5 goals, which matches his total from last season. His passing ability is exceptional. The way that he finds the quiet areas and he sets up his teammates, his development curve just in the the start of this year has been fantastic and I think he's going to have a fantastic World Juniors. I legitimately think he could be a third line contributor and someone that the Leafs look to to create offense but is also um, good defensively and I could see him kind of meshing with Philip Hollander a little bit on that third line uh, with the future of the Leafs. Yeah I think they knocked it out of the park with this pick. He's what I would call a very intelligent center. He's only five foot nine, but he actually uses a stick that's longer than most players his height would use, and he uses it pretty effectively. So he likes to uh, disrupt passes or inter uh, deflect shots out of the way. If he were to kind of transition to the men's league in Finland and then eventually to the NHL, do the Leafs want to keep him at center? Can he prove that he's a dominant enough player to stay down the middle? Or would they prefer a guy of his size, of his kind of play off on the wing? And I think his defensive game is strong enough that you could make a very strong argument for keeping him at center, but it kind of just depends how he develops and what kind of player he develops into. It's clear with Roni Hirvonen and a bunch of other players in this prospect pyramid that Team Finland and Team Russia are going to be can't-miss viewing for Leafs fans. With Tier 3 wrapped up, let's move on to Tier 4. We start with the center, Mikhail Abramov. He was a fourth-round pick, 115th overall by the Leafs in 2019. He plays with the Victoria Tigra of the QMJHL, and in 63 games last season, he had 35 goals, 41 assists, for 76 points. This season, in nine games, forget being a point per game, this guy was over an assist per game. He had four goals and 10 assists for 14 points in nine games. Of course, his season has been cut short so far on account of, um, have you heard of the pandemic? The QMJHL started up, it was a bit controversial, it went on for a while, and then it stopped for obvious reasons. But you will be able to watch Abramov coming up at the World Juniors, and Scott Wheeler loves this guy. He was a skinny kid, uh, sort of growing up, and, and that built into a game that kind of relied on playing off the flanks and, and playing on the perimeter. He reshaped his game last year, though. It sort of took on a more decisive role, if you will, with the Victoriaville Tigers, started attacking the middle some more, started taking more shots, became a goal scorer on that team. Now he's headed to Team Russia for the World Juniors, should take on a really prominent role in the second or third, maybe third line on that team but just does a lot of things with a lot of skill and has improved his pace, has improved his strength, has gotten stronger. I believe he's kind of 185, 190 pounds now, which is a big deal for him. Now, if you've been picking up on the trends, you might look at this prospect pyramid and go, the Leafs aren't very good defensively, and you've only said two defensemen so far, Steve. That's about to stop with our next player, Topi Nimala. He was a third-round pick, 64th overall in this most recent draft in 2020, and he's a right D who's excited! Just seven points in 43 games in the SM Liga last season with Carpot, but... Like I said, with forwards, it's very difficult for teenagers to play in basically any of these pro leagues in Europe and stick and have a big role there. It's even harder for defensemen. Another guy to look for at the World Juniors with Finland. His skating is his strongest asset. He has great mechanics and acceleration. He's very good um, uh, with his gap control. He can keep up with incoming skaters on the rush, uh, and he's he likes to push them to the outsides. Our next player is also a defender, and you actually heard his name pretty recently. 
Mac Hollowell. Hollowell is another defender and another right-handed defender, and the reason that you heard his name recently is he was actually invited to the bubble. He split this past season between the AHL and the ECHL. He actually played more in the AHL, but with the Leafs organization, you gotta not be weirded out by the ECHL. Because, I don't know if you've noticed this, but Kyle Dubas likes to do things a little differently. And he actually uses the ECHL, the Newfoundland Growlers, as a developmental team. With so many other teams, it seems like the ECHL is just, ugh, here, we'll shove you here for a while. For Hollowell, he did extremely well in the ECHL. As a defender, he had three goals, ten assists, 13 points in just 19 games. With the Marlies, three goals, nine assists for 12 points in 34 games. And because of how well he did, the Leafs afforded him that opportunity in the bubble, and he's one of the very few North American players the Leafs have in their entire organization who's actually playing games right now. Right now, he's with Toto Turku of Mestis, that's the second tier Finnish league. He's played in six games, and he's got six points. At 5'10", 163 pounds, he is a small defender, but I'm less concerned about this prospect with regard to that. A lot of guys, if they're drafted small, we go, eh, how is he going to adapt to the men's professional game, how is he going to adapt to North America? With Mac Hollowell, we already know the answer to that, and it's pretty well. The NHL is full of small players who are pretty good at hockey. It's only a red flag if it appears to hold you back in the NHL. And so far, Mac Hollowell, the way he's projecting, it doesn't look like it is. Up next, we have a face I know you're familiar with, and that's Adam Brooks, because he played seven games with the Leafs last year and had three assists. He was a fourth rounder, 92nd overall in 2016, and he was drafted older. He's already 24, so let's be clear, this is his last year on the prospect pyramid, it's make the team or get off the pot. Which is tough because the Leafs have so many forwards and we're still not sure about the taxi squad and everything. I don't know if he makes the team. But based on what I saw last season, if Adam Brooks were to play some games for the Leafs or if the Leafs use him as a trade chip, He's good. He did well in the minors last season with 20 points in 29 games, and I really like what I saw in his seven NHL games. He was fast, he was tenacious, he could read plays well. This is a guy who I think can play NHL minutes right now. I just don't know if it'll be with the Leafs. Just like Adam Brooks, Igor Korshkov is in his final year for this prospect pyramid. He's 24. It's time to prove yourself. The 31st overall pick, second round pick in 2016, the second pick after Austin Matthews, there were big expectations, especially because the Leafs could have had Alex DeBrincat, as we have mentioned several times over the years. Finally comes to North America to play with the Toronto Marlies. 16 goals, 9 assists for 25 points in 44 games in the AHL. Not mind-blowing, but good. He gets a call-up with the Leafs, scores a goal in that game, and the team was not playing good in that game. And then they sent him down, which I, I didn't like. I never liked that. I wish they had given him at least a few more games because he was one of the only Leafs that tried that night. But I almost put Korshkov in Tier 3, and I'll tell you why. So far this season, with the KHL's Lokomotiv Yaroslavl, he has 12 goals and 11 assists for 23 points in 34 games. That leads the entire team in scoring. Just like Adam Brooks, I think Korshkov could be on an NHL roster right now. But will he fit on the Leafs? Both Brooks and Korshkov, if they can't find homes in the Leafs roster, might want to look at a trade. Our last player in Tier 4, actually the day I'm shooting this, was just named assistant captain of the Finnish World Junior Team, Miko Kokinen, a left defender. He was a third round pick, 84th overall in 2019. He hasn't exactly put up big numbers in SM Liga this season, he's only got the three assists in 18 games, but obviously the Finnish program likes him enough that they think he's a leader to put a letter on his chest for the World Juniors. I've heard that he might be playing on a pairing with Topi Niemela, which would be really cool for Leafs fans if you could watch and have an entire pairing that's Leaf prospects. He played seven games at last year's World Juniors and had just the two goals. I would really like to see him step it up and make a statement this year. Let's start Tier 5 with another defender, William Villeneuve, a right defenseman for the St. John Sea Dogs of the QMJHL. Big numbers last season. Nine goals, 49 assists for 58 points in 64 games. He only had six points in 15 games this season, but it, it, the, the QMJHL season so far, it basically does not count. Despite the fact that he put up all those points, Lauren explains there are warning signs. So he was the top defensive scorer in the QMJHL last season. So the offensive ability is there. 
Uh, he's pretty good on zone entries, but the advanced numbers kind of seem to indicate that it's very easy for opponents to break in past him. Uh, he's not really a, that effective in stopping incoming rushes. And I know as Leafs fans, that's something that can be concerning when we look at defensemen that the team has had in the past. And his gap to control when he's defending is is also an issue. Defenders can blow past him or he kind of takes the wrong lanes to closing off players when they're coming in. And it, it just, he's, he's not a great defenseman, which is concerning considering that's the position he plays. So uh, it's a little concerning to hear about his defensive deficiencies, but he's got a special skill set. When you're the top in anything, you have a special skill set. In order to lead the queue in defensive scoring, you got to be good. Even if he's got his warts, there aren't many perfect players in the NHL draft every year. So I think the Leafs were right to at least take a flyer on this guy and see how he develops. Up next, a left-handed right winger, Vidi Mietnin. He's already 19, but he's got a September birthday. He would have been drafted at 18 in any other draft year. That's a weird little wrinkle this year. He's 5'9", 159 pounds. Make no mistake, he's small. But he played with Keiko Espu of the Junior A League in Finland and scored a lot. In 52 games, he had 42 goals, 31 assists for 73 points. Now, I know what you're wondering. Steve, I don't know anything about the Junior A League in Sweden. Is that good? Well, put it this way. The next highest scorer on his own team had just 21 goals and 49 points. So, uh... I'm going to say it is. This year, he's in the NCAA. He's with St. Cloud State, and he's already got four points in five games. Seems like a pretty smart flyer for a guy they picked in the sixth round this past draft. Now we get into the goalies, starting with a goalie who was picked this past year, Arter Aktyumov. He's six foot tall, 156 pounds. He's your new age goalie bone rack build. He's another guy who's going to be at the World Juniors. He's going to be on Team Russia. The problem is with Askarov in there, I don't know how often he's going to play, but if Askarov were to get hurt, or if you hear that Aktyumov's going to be playing in a game, I know I'm going to be watching. Joseph Wool, a third rounder from 2016. Uh, this guy, he just seems so nice. He reminds me of James Reimer. Last season was his first full professional one, and he struggled mightily. In 32 games, he had an 880 save percentage. In fairness, remember I said earlier the Marlies were really bad last season? I, I really cannot emphasize enough how bad they were after Sheldon Keefe left, and that's a tough gig for a rookie goalie. With Wool, I still have faith, but we need to see him improve. We need to see evidence that he's taking strides, and with no hockey games to play, um, that's kind of hard. And the last goalie in this pyramid, uh, speaking of no hockey games being played, Ian Scott. He was absolutely spectacular with the WHL's Prince Albert Raiders and then he had to get season-ending hip surgery causing him to miss all of last season which basically should have been his pro debut but if he can get back to the level that he was playing at in the WHL yeah, that's a compelling player. Another sixth round pick from this past draft that I really like, forward Axel Rindell. He's actually Miko Kokinen's teammate in Finland with Jokerit Mikkeli. And worth mentioning that he's doing that as a defender. He is a right D, this guy. It is worth noting that he's already 20 and he's going to be 21 in April, but that's still very impressive. And six foot tall, about a buck 75, still got room to grow. Interesting late round flyer. Rindell was an older pick, but we've already talked about how the Leafs love drafting guys with late birthdays, and Dmitry Avchinikov is 18, but in any other year he would have been drafted as a 17-year-old. He's another Russian forward, and like Amirov, uh, there aren't a lot of KHL stats available. But in the MHL, which is the KHL Junior Leagues, he was at a point per game. So far this season, in 26 games with Sibirsky, that's the junior team of Sibir Novosibirsk, he's got 39 points, which leads the team. Next, we have another defender. See, I told you we'd get to some. Michael Koster, a left D, who was taken in the fifth round in 2019. He's 19 now, 20 in March. He's 5'9", about a buck 70. He's a guy to watch playing with the University of Minnesota. So far, he's got three points in his first eight collegiate games. Pontus Holmberg, a left winger who was a sixth round pick of the Leafs in 2018. I don't know, something about this guy compels me. Now, he is 21 and will be 22 in April. Didn't score at a magnificent pace in Sweden last year, but he's already got nine points in 19 games, which is a much better pace 
and something weird I noticed. This season, he's teammates with Jakob Forsbacka Carlson, who is a former second round pick of the Boston Bruins and has played over 20 games in the NHL with the Boston Bruins. And so far, on the same team as Pontus Holmberg, Forsbacka Carlson has just four assists in 24 games. And we're about to wrap this up with three straight defenders, starting with Philip Kral. He's a fifth rounder from 2018. He put up 49 points in 53 games in his final season in the WHL with the Spokane Chiefs. The Leafs signed him to an NHL contract in early April, and if you're like, hey, how did I miss that? It's because you were wondering whether or not it was safe to go to the grocery store. He's on loan in the Czech Republic right now. He was in the Tier 2 league and was a point-per-game defenseman there. He's in the top league, 15 games played so far, 3 points. Next we have Christians Rubens, a left defender, signed the same day as Philip Kral, the first undrafted player on this list, and he's the biggest, 6 foot 4, 221 pounds. Now despite that size, he's not a goon at all. Last season in the AHL, he had just 6 penalty minutes. He had 14 points in 47 games in the AHL last season, and you don't sign a guy to an NHL contract unless you're like, we might need this guy in the NHL one day. Finally, the last player on this prospect pyramid, a right-handed defender, another undrafted guy by the name of Joseph Duzak. Like Rubens, he's an older player, but far more offensive. He split last season between the ECHL and the AHL. He was over a point per game as a defenseman in the ECHL and just under a point per game in the AHL. The problem is the defensive side of the game. Probably a pretty long, long shot, but if the Leafs were ever in desperate need of a power play quarterback, who knows, he could be an extreme depth option. Couple notes before we finish. Steve, where's Justin Brazo? I don't feature any players in this prospect pyramid unless they are a Leaf draft pick or signed to an NHL contract. Brazo is in a league of his own. He was an amazing overage OHL player. The Leafs signed him to an AHL deal and they are basically developing him as their own product, but he is not yet on an NHL deal, so I can't feature him. Also, hey, where's Alexander Barabanov and Miko Lettinen? I barely had Adam Brooks and Igor Korshkov on this list. Both Barabanov and Lettinen are on the other side of 25. They're not prospects anymore, they're just guys. They might be pretty good guys, but I am certainly not gonna put them in this pyramid. So, ah, that is it for the 2020 Toronto Maple Leafs prospect pyramid. What'd you think? Did I miss anybody? Did I screw up anyone's position? Leave a comment in the comment box down below. But for now, that is it for this year's edition of the Toronto Maple Leafs prospect pyramid. Thank you very much for watching and special thank you to Rachel Dory, Scott Wheeler, and Lauren Kelly for their participation and frankly their guidance throughout this whole process. Click like if you like this video, click subscribe if you really liked it. Tell all your friends Nick Robertson is a forward.